follow this 73-point checklist to never write a bad NFT contract again. Quick note, this episode ended up being so comprehensive and long that I have split it into four parts. This is part one. And now, more about what it is all about. It's practically impossible to write a bad NFT smart contract with this 73-point checklist. If you're new at smart contract writing, this can be an NFT learning roadmap for you. You can go through the checklist one by one and ask yourself questions. Can you implement this feature? Do you understand what this feature does? Do you know why this is important? If you can do all those things, go to the next point. If not, go read about it, go learn it, go implement it, then come back to the next point. And if you have already written a couple of smart contracts, this is a very helpful resource for you when writing your next contract to go through all the points and to make sure that you do not forget about anything important. There's a lot to cover, so let's go. Hi, I'm Radek, a developer advocate at QuickNote, and this is a 73-point checklist on how to write NFT smart contracts. First, what it is and what it is not. It's a set of best practices writing NFT smart contracts on Ethereum. It is meant to give you all the important items, to summarize them, to make sure that you know they exist. And for the sake of brevity, it's just mentioned, it's not described in 100% detail. This checklist, although it also focuses on security, it does not replace the need for security audits. So what's inside? All 73 points are divided into eight categories. And at the end, there is a helpful resources section with good smart contract examples, with resources to further study, and even with the whole roadmap on how to learn writing NFT smart contracts if you are starting out. First, let's start with the preparation section. One of the very first things you need to do when writing a smart contract is to pick an NFT type. Will it be ERC721 or ERC1155? 721 is the current widespread standard. Almost all the major NFT projects are 721 or the modifications like 721A. One of the first ones was CryptoKitties. And if you want to see many, many more examples of 721 token contracts, there is a whole section on Etherscan of ERC721 contracts. ERC1155, on the other hand, is a different contract in a way that it supports not just non-fungible tokens, which is what NFT is, but also semi-fungible tokens or even fungible tokens. It also has a few other features like batch transfers, can be reverted in the event of a mistake, so things that cannot be done with 7 to 1. And if you want to see more examples of 1155 token contracts, there is another category on Etherscan of all the contracts. Usually what you see on OpenSea is ERC721 or the variations of it. Let's assume that you are starting out with this one. Next, what you need to do is pick the base contract implementation. You do not need to start writing everything from scratch. To help you out with that, there are a few base contract implementations that are open source, security audited, battle tested, and used in many different contracts. And uh, the most widespread is Open Zeppelin. They have a whole set of helpful contracts you can choose ERC721, ERC1155. There is a very good documentation as well. You can't go wrong with them. Next, there is ERC721A, which is an improved implementation of ERC721. And the main feature is gas savings when minting more than one token. And the few notable projects that use ERC721A is Moonbirds, Doodles, Goblin Town, or Adidas. And the last one is Soulmate, less popular than the first two, but very good nonetheless. 
And this one focuses a lot on gas optimizations. Next on the list, and it could actually be even point one on the list, is to pick the chain to deploy into. And the whole previous episode is about choosing technologies around NFT contracts. So if you need the pros and cons of all the major blockchains, go watch the previous episode. And the same goes for metadata storage, on-chain, off-chain, different options, what's best. Everything is in the previous episode. Also make sure to use the latest Solidity compiler. For now it's 0.8.16. And use more than tools for developing the contracts. Hardhat and Foundry are not actually even the tools, the whole development environments to create the contracts. Hardhat is the most feature-rich one and used probably by the majority of smart contract developers right now. And Foundry is the new kid on the block that is high quality and gaining popularity quite quickly. The last point in the preparation stage is to create a Gnosis safe wallet for proceeds and royalties to actually start thinking before the project starts about how the funds will be used and managed and secured. The next category is security essentials. I will not be focusing on all the security points, which could be like tens or hundreds. I will focus on some of them and some of those security essentials will be general, like remember this or that. Some of them will be very specific. Use this, don't use that. So the first thing to keep in mind is that nothing on the blockchain is private. So even if you have some private variables in your smart contract, there is always a way to see it on the blockchain, what the value of that private variable is. In this instance, private only means that only your contract can access it, not that no one can see it. The next important point is to practically never use transaction origin. The only real use case is to check if the smart contract is calling your code. Don't use it for anything else. Don't verify the source of the transaction. It can lead to phishing attacks. This one is quite specific as well. Encode packed and hash collisions. For example, when using ABI encode packed, these two values when encoded will have the same value, the same hash actually. So it's better to use ABI encode instead of ABI encode packed. Calling multiple functions. This is not something that is common, but it's also not something that is well known. So calling multiple functions in a Solidity function has undefined order. So it doesn't matter if you write it like uh, method one and method two in my function when calling it, it doesn't guarantee that method one will be called before method two or the other way around. It depends on the Solidity version. This might be a big problem if one or even both functions change the state of the blockchain. So it's then important in which order they are called. Relying on exact Ether balances in your smart contract is also not something that you should ever do. The reason being that anybody can change the balance of the smart contract by, first of all, directly sending Ether into it. But even if you disable sending Ether into the smart contract, it's still possible to do by, for example, a self-destruct function in a smart contract when it's forcibly sent to an address or to a smart contract and there is no way to prevent it. So if you have any checks or logic depending on exact Ether balances, don't do it and come up with another logic, not something that can be manipulated by outside forces. Delegate call is a more advanced topic and if you are using it, you're probably aware of its benefits and also threats. But in essence, when you use delegate call, you give unlimited power to the contract that is not your contract. You are delegating the call to an outside contract. And this should be used only with the contracts that you can control. 
Otherwise, you are putting your contract and your project at risk. This one is quite important and quite serious. Not checking for reverts from untrusted contracts. For example, if you have a function that makes a call to an external contract, it could be the one in line two or the one in line three, if any of these calls can be reverted, then anything after that, for example, like a function on line five to do anything, this might never happen if those previous ones are reverted. So either change the order of the functions or add more logic to it so that the important stuff that you want to happen actually happens. Solidity is a relatively new programming language and it's constantly being developed and updated. So before committing to using a certain version, check to see if it has known bugs and read through release announcements for that specific version. Next point is a little less common in NFTs, more common in DeFi, but it can also happen in NFTs as well. So ensure information sources cannot be manipulated. So if your contract in any way relies on a price of an outside asset and you are checking the price of that asset and then doing anything that depends on that price, then you have to be aware that the price of that asset can be manipulated with, for example, a flash loan, where suddenly in one block, in one transaction, that price can either drop suddenly or grow like twice or 10 times. And then the logic in your smart contract can be very dangerous. If you allow users to store arbitrary strings, like for example, giving the name to your NFT that you're minting, then make sure that nobody is injecting JavaScript into the website. Next category of points to check is about testing. First, do the testing and use testing tools. Use testing tools specific to your blockchains and use different types of testing tools. Formal verification, symbolic execution, linters, test coverage analyzers, anything that there is a tool for, use it, learn how it works and take advantage of it. Next, go for that 100% test coverage. It's annoying, it's hard to do like the last 10 or 20%, but you need to do it. A bug in smart contract can end your project and your company. So it's a small price to pay for that annoyance. Write unit tests. Think about what your smart contract needs to do and write unit tests for that. So for example, the scenario, only the admin can post the contracts or non-admins cannot mint new tokens. The contract reverts on errors. Here, for example, there are a few different scenarios, one for initial state, one for minting, one for transferring, then you describe what it needs to do, can transfer decreasing center's balance and so on. And then you have a few assertions at the end. So what needs to happen at the end of that scenario and see if that happens in your unit tests. Mutation test. This one is an interesting one. So even if you write the unit test, like in the previous step, it's still easy to make a mistake even in writing the test itself. And off by one mistake is the, the most common one. So what mutation tests do is that they take the variable and then they run the test with many different values for that variable, tens of hundreds or even thousands of values for that specific variable. And then in each instance of the value, the mutation test checks if the outcome of the test is what you expect it to be. Next, formatted code. It's not about security, but it's more about readability. The easier it is to read 
the smart contract, the easier it is to spot the mistakes, the differences, something that is not supposed to be there. So we should use a tool like Prettier to maintain consistent code formatting throughout your code base. There is a whole set of security tools that you must know and be able to use. This is something that all the security companies or like smart contract audit companies use as the first step. So you shouldn't potentially pay the smart contract audit company thousands of dollars for something that you can do yourself in an hour or two. So you have tools for a static analysis, for fuzzing, for symbolic execution. You have paid services, you have free edition, you have even a list of Docker containers configured with all the trail of bit security tools mentioned in the first point. And all these security tools can do the 80% of all the hard work for you and you can focus on the rest. Now for the more specific things of what to do or not to do. The first is to go through each function that you have in your smart contract and think about what this function needs to do and who should be able to call it. One mistake can cause you the whole project. For example, the famous parity wallet freeze was forgetting to put only owner modifier on one of the functions. That's it. That's all it takes. Next, think about the inputs into your smart contracts and validate them properly. So for example, what can be the minimum or the maximum of the input integers? Should it be allowed to go below zero or is it not even possible? Are arrays or bytes expected to have a certain length or not? Is it dynamic? Think about all of this beforehand and validate properly. Similar to checking all the access control for all the functions, also go through all the functions one by one and uh, think if they need to be public, private, external or internal. Some of the functions that are usually public can actually be just external, which is almost the same, but not the same. And external also costs less gas than public. So you are also saving money for yourself and for your NFT project users. Next, as part of your testing, simulate minting out what happens when you mint your last NFT. Are you able to go on? Do you see an error? Do you see an information? What happens? Also, measure gas usage. For that, use ETH gas reporter. And this is an example output. You see the contract name, you see the method name, you see minimum, maximum, average, and you also get the average price in euro or dollars or whatever you configure for that specific function or contract or deployment. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the whole checklist does not mean that you do not need to audit your code. Smart contract is not as easily upgradable as putting something on the server. So you need to make sure that you are deploying something that works now and will work in the future and that there are no bugs that will jeopardize your whole project or a company. This is the end of part one of the episode on how to write a good NFT smart contract. Part two will be all about gas savings and gas optimizations.